Hello everybody and welcome to another video from Carl's Tech Shed. Right, what I've got for you today is this little device here which I picked up on eBay recently for 99p. Now for those of you that don't know what this is, this is a Pocket Surfer 2 made by a company called Datawind. Now these were quite popular about six or seven years ago. Um, it's basically uh, an internet surfing device which uses a GPRS modem to connect to the internet. Now the reason this was so popular is because at the time uh, the most the most popular smartphones around were something like a Nokia N95 or something like that um, which had a very small screen so this has got a relatively large LCD screen um, I haven't got the exact figure on what size the screen is but it goes from corner to corner it's not a touch screen um, the keyboard here vaguely resembles the um, keypad on the old Motorola Razr mobile phone which came out about 10 years ago something like that in that you've got these uh, you've got these metallic keys um, with cutouts here to make them slightly flexible and it's got a relatively nice feel to it but I can imagine that doing quite a lot of typing on that trying to write maybe an email or an instant message would become quite difficult after a, after a period of time now the reason I bought this was because the seller sold it to me as faulty simply because it refuses to connect to the network anymore. Um, so to be honest with you I haven't even bothered charging it up. The only reason I bought it is because I wanted to see what was inside it. The reason I, 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 I wanted to see what was inside it is because nobody knows what is inside it. Uh, even the spec sheet from Datawind, uh, I've got it here on the screen actually, I'll let you have a look. Um, we've got a series of FAQs here someone, uh, someone's put up on their page and someone simply asked what kind of processor does it have so you'd expect maybe a model number or an architect, uh, architecture type or something along those lines and all they've come out with is this ridiculous statement about oh it doesn't matter you know uh, Datawind's unique network architecture makes the actual processing power uh, resides on its powerful and secure servers giving it unparalleled processing power for a handheld device which is absolute nonsense because if, they, if somebody's asked what sort of processor it has um, they, they want to know what type of chip it has, not what type of power it has. Uh, same goes for the memory, just up here it says how much memory does it have? And again they've just gone back to the same answer about having some sort of connection to its secure servers. So what I want to do this evening is just crack it open and uh, find out what's inside it. Okay, well as you can see, the most uh, prominent thing that stands out is going to be this uh, battery at the bottom here. Now we've got some specs on here. It says here that it's a 3.7 volt at 1380 microamp hours. Um, we've got a part number there as well. I'm pretty sure this is going to be lithium ion. I haven't looked it up, but it just looks for type. I, I very much doubt it would be lithium polymer, and it's certainly not nickel cadmium. So uh, lithium ion is going to be the most likely technology with inside that. Um, now we've got the small GPRS board over here. We've actually got a model number here. Uh, this is a SIM 340Z GPRS module. Now this is a standard off-the-shelf um, GPRS module. Um, probably what they've done is they've probably um, made some sort of interface board or something to go here to, to link it over to the main board. Uh, we'll have a look at that in a moment because obviously being off the shelf it's going to need some sort of uh, bridging to, to link that into their custom board. So we'll have a look at this second part. Now we've got um, a couple of logos here. We've got a ROHS compliant logo uh, which basically means it doesn't contain lead or any other nasties um, to have a minimal impact on the environment if it were to end up in landfill. 
Um, we've got an anti-static uh, logo here, which is quite common. I've seen that a lot on anti-static bags and such. Um, we've got a barcode number here. Uh, I've looked this up on Google, but I can't find anything, so it's probably just a serial number or something insignificant like that. Uh, we've also got another part number. Now this one is more, uh, this one's more sophisticated. This is going to be the revision number of this board because we've got R2. So I'm guessing there was probably an R1, um, which either was for an earlier model or it didn't quite make the spec. Um, so this is going to be R2. So the part number on this is uh, DW, which which stands for Data Wind RC04. Um, I'm not quite sure what the RC04 stands for, but R2 is most likely going to be revision two. Uh, and obviously we've got the word mainboard. Now we've got a date code here, which uh, indicates to me this was made in the 30th week of the year 2007. So this would be about right for uh, when I saw them advertised on the London Underground a few years ago. Now this board simply clicks out, there we go. Now underneath you'll see that we've just got a small uh, header connector here which then links into this board here. Now we'll take a, de a, a more detailed look at that in just a moment. What we've got here, we've got a standard uh, mini USB port, not a micro USB but just a standard mini USB port. Now I've had to look very carefully at these tracks and uh, this is primarily um, simply for charging. There's no data connection. The uh, data the data pins not actually connected. Uh, the only pins which connect are the two power, the uh, plus five volts and ground. Um, so this is not you're not able to link this up to your PC in any way. Um, not because of software limitations, but simply because it's, it physically does not have the capability of uh, being linked into a PC. Now we've got a couple of chips here. I've looked these up. Via, these are simple um, power management chips for charging the battery. Um, what we've got here, we've got a SIM card tray, and it's it's unusual because this has an orange SIM card in it. Um, now I would have thought this would be maybe under Vodafone or T-Mobile or something like that. Um, what you'll also notice is on the SIM card, there's a little bit of uh, melting. So I can imagine that uh, where this this other board has been laying down like that, one of the chips has probably got slightly hot, and uh, it seems to have melted away the SIM card a little bit. Uh, now, what what we've got next to it here? Let me take that SIM card out so I can let you have a proper look at this damn thing. Right, okay, it seems to be quite difficult to get that out. Uh, let's leave that in there for a moment. Now, here's this little board here which connects into this uh, GPRS module. I'll lift this out. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that everything in here is just held in uh, by itself. There's very few screws or anything to hold anything down. So I'm just going to try and unplug this. There we go. Oh, I've got the aerial connector on the other side, so if we pop that off. Right, now as I mentioned about this little board here, um, this uh, module with the uh, can around it, this is just a standard GPRS module, so this would probably be used in a number of different applications, including probably sat-navs, um, communications equipment, and, you know, a, a f dozens of other applications. So this is a standard off-the-shelf board. Um, the part which isn't off-the-shelf, this has been custom designed by Datawind for this device, is this small flex PCB. Now uh, we've got another part number on the back here. Um, try and focus on that. Again that starts with uh, DW. It's also got the RC04 um, and this is the communications board. Now on this one it's a bit unusual because we've got uh, we've got the anti-static logo, but the uh, ROHS logo is missing. Uh, but what we've got here is a uh, what we call a WE symbol, which is the um, WEEE legislation, which came into uh, which came into the uh, European Union a few years ago now, um, which basically meant anything with lead, cadmium, or any, anything electrical cannot be discarded in normal waste. So I'm assuming that this board, they had no other way of making it other than using uh, leaded components. Um, the component which, uh, which may be uh, 
uh, cause which may be causing it not to have the ROHS compliancy. Uh, maybe this uh, cap here, um, because they contain a number of different metals, um, so that could well be the reason why uh, why it couldn't be ROHS compliant. Now on here we've just got a very simple little board here, we've just got a capacitor for power, we've got a few transistors and a few capacitors and uh, resistors, so there's no, there's no logic on there whatsoever, it's simply converting the signal and the power from here and sending it over to the, uh, to the main board. So if we go back and have a look at this board here. Now another thing you'll notice is that the lithium ion battery is soldered in, um, which means technically it's non-replaceable. So if the battery were to wear out as it as it would, the same with any other lithium ion battery and any other device, uh, without soldering on you would not be able to replace it. Um, which I find very wasteful because uh, otherwise this would have this is effectively given an, a finite life by the battery, um, which is which is a great shame for a a half decent piece of kit like this. Now again on this board there's not a lot here, there's a few uh, pads here where there's missing um, components and connectors. Now this one had me stumped for a little while, I thought maybe it was for an external SIM card tray because we've got the internal SIM card here uh, which is a lot easier to slide out now I've taken that GPRS module out. And as you'll see it's just a standard uh, orange SIM card so they're obviously using uh, the orange network these were given. Uh, these devices were given a, a limit of 20 megabytes per month of data, free of charge. Um, the reason it's maybe not connecting up to the network is because DataWind may well have pulled the plug on this little project and decided there's so few people using this now that there's no point in paying uh, to keep the network open. So they've simply closed it down. Um, I will be perfectly honest with you, I was a little bit cheeky, I put this inside my phone a little bit earlier to see if I could get a signal on it, and there was absolutely no signal on it whatsoever, uh, it didn't even detect the phone number for the card, so these must have been uh, custom programmed either by Orange or by DataWind simply to work as a data SIM card, and once it hits that 20 meg limit, it either cuts off or it will probably ask you to pay some money um, to, use, to use the network uh, further on from the 20 meg allowance. Now as I said this had me stumped for a while, I thought it was a little SIM card tray but what I think it actually is, is a micro SD card slot because you've got a small cutout in the rubber housing here which looks like it would allow you to put a micro SD card in, so this was probably in a later revision uh, of the board or a later model that they would have added the SIM card slot. Uh, sorry, micro SD card slot. Um, we've got a couple of uh, capacitors here. Uh, this is all going to be power management, uh, probably for the processor, which which is going to link in here. I'll let you have a look at that in a moment. Uh, we've got another uh, pair of tracks here, which are which are empty. Um, I'm not quite sure what these are for because if you look carefully, these are quite these are slightly offset in that you've got a series of uh, a, you've got a fewer number of pins on this side than you'd have on this side. So maybe it was just a connector for a different board. Maybe they decided to go for this this connector rather than a rather than a longer wider connector um, with um, with wider spacing between the pins. But let's have a look at this processor board. Now uh, this is quite interesting because we've got uh, the main processor in this. I've actually worked it out. It is, as I as I assumed, it is an ARM-based processor. Um, it's a Sharp LZ LHZ uh, sorry LH seven nine five two four, which uh, I've looked it up on Google. Let me just uh, bring my Mac back online. Right now, I've got the data sheet up here for the um, for the processor, and what we've got it's a 70 megahertz ARM-based processor. Um, what's interesting about it is though that it's got a built-in 10 100 base Ethernet connection. It's got a built-in USB 2 um, controller. It's got a color LCD controller, 10 input, 10 bit HD converter with integrated touchscreen controller. Um, it's got four DMA channels, SD RAM controller, NAND flash support, uh, serial interface, and so on. So 
aside from the 70 megahertz uh, operating speed, which is incredibly low in today's terms, um, it's it's a relatively good chip. Uh, the reason I think the marketing team at uh, DataWind decided not to put these specs on the box and to keep them secret was I suppose they thought people may be scared off by the low power of the device in that it's only 70 megahertz compared to maybe uh, a PDA. Um, I seem to remember uh, taking apart HP iPack. Uh, 1940 model I think and that had something like a 266 megahertz uh, processor in it and that was a full touch screen unit so um, I mean, that was quite that was probably about 2004 2005 when that came out so it's a big drop down to 70 megahertz uh, for a device of, of such a relatively new age of only sort of uh, five or six years old so I think that is the main reason they didn't put that on the uh, on the spec sheet or on the box now if we look next to it we've got uh, a small NAND flash chip made by ST. Now I've looked this part number up, I can't quite see it from at this angle, but I've looked it up and that is a 16 megabyte uh, flash chip. Now we've got two RAM chips here, again I've looked these up and these are two 16 megabyte uh, memory chips. So these are the RAM, so you've got 32 megs of RAM and uh, 16 megs of, of ROM effectively on a 70 megahertz processor. Now although it doesn't sound like a lot, that's more than enough really to get you on online with such, such a small screen. Um, again, with it not be, with it uh, having a touch screen controller built in, they probably chose this processor so that for a later version if they chose to add a touch screen that they wouldn't need to uh, change the design too much and that they could just add uh, a few extra components. For example, they've got a small pad down here for a chip they haven't used. That may well be for the um, SD card controller because I've noticed that uh, although it has a built-in USB 2 hub it doesn't have uh, an SD card support native on the ARM processor so that, that, that there may, be, may well be for uh, an SD card controller chip uh, because the the size of it is right, it's a quad flat pack, uh, quad flat pack design uh, and also uh, if we revert back to here you can see that we have actually got uh, a room for a micro SD card um, slot so that I, I, I'd be more than happy to say I'm, you know, that, that is what it's going to be for uh, I'm, I'm almost certain of that now, to be honest, I don't think there's really much part, not much point in taking the rest of it apart. Um, there's not going to be much inside there, just a stand, bog standard LCD um, keyboard membrane and such. There's a couple of uh, LEDs on here which apparently come on when you've got email or when you've got an instant message, or uh, I think another one probably blinks when it's being connected to the internet or downloading data. But aside from that, there's not really much inside that I can uh, take take apart any further. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the video, so thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see if I can find some other interesting stuff to tear down and uh, let you have a look at it. So thanks for watching. Okay, well, uh, curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to uh, open up the LCD, and I was quite surprised to find on the back of it was uh, a GPS antenna and GPS controller, which I was quite surprised at, because it was never mentioned on the specs. Um, so whether they added it and uh, just decided not to use it uh, is another matter, or perhaps they, they added it on for a later model, um, but didn't include the software in, in this model. So, um, yeah, quite an interesting bit of kit there. I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't actually looked the part number up on this. Um, I can tell that the antenna is custom because, again, it's got that um, DW uh, part number on there. Uh, and I've got, what else is on there? Yeah, it uh, just says uh, DW RCO4 R3 GPS Ant. Um, along the top here we've got a series of LCDs, which, uh, uh, sorry, LEDs, um, which would again go on to that little um, bit at the top, which would indicate which um, whether you had an email or something like that. Uh, let's just have a quick look here. Um, yeah, we've got a GPS flex cable. It's all marked out. It says GPS flex cable. Uh, this one here is obviously for the LCD, so that's the LCD flex cable. Uh, the uh, GPS antenna chip is uh, actually made by ST, so it's a relatively good chip. 
I can't see what's on that small chip there, but both of these are BGA chips. But this one seems to be, um, it, it's too shiny. There's, it's not a, a standard ceramic chip like this one next to it. Um, so I'm guessing this is just a silicon uh, directly, onto the, um, directly onto the board. Um, there's no housing around it and the, uh, the actual chip would be etched onto the other side of that and then linked directly onto it. But apart from that, there's not really much uh, worth taking apart in there. Uh, you've just got the standard uh, power power controller chip here for the LCD, a small capacitor, a few flex cables uh, to go into the main board, and that's about it. But I thought I'd share that with you anyway.